hope you are not leaving. <laughs> okay, so several specific questions I want to ask here, and I'm sure there will be better questions asked by the young people, young leaders participating in this afternoon sessions. That is, what exactly, exactly are the goals you are talking about following this morning's discussion? What exactly is the road and the map and the path you would like to subscribe or suggest and explain them? What exactly were some of the lessons and experiences you learned through the exact context of your country's education and beyond? What do you think exactly how we can learn from those things happened in the past with our systems, with our teaching methods, and with our relationship with the students, and how we can do better today, and how it's not a goal, it's about specifics. So I want the specifics, ladies and gentlemen, in the afternoon, if we can, and I'm honored to be joined by two panels in the afternoon. The first panel will be mainly business leaders, coupled up with a number of advisors as well, and our young leaders. And the second panel will mainly be about how can we figure out a roadmap to get to the goals where we desire. So I will announce all the names, all the names that will appear in the afternoon together. But I will direct specifically the names of people for the very first panel later. OK. So we will have from business leader side, Daniel Tranavanot, who is from the CP group, sitting here. And also we have David Cruikshank, uh, who is a former chairman of Deloitte. We have Jerry He, who is a vice president of a Bright School from China. We also have Daniel Lee, president of Fulcrum Investments from the US. And we have David Lee, Vice Chairman of Global Banking from JP Morgan. These are the business leaders. We also have young leaders coming from different parts of the world. They are Damien Bosalinger, who is coming from Germany, uh, Origin uh, Igiranes. I hope I pronounced your name right, coming from Rwanda. You can correct me when you're on the stage. And also Fan Jesse Young from China. Danny Bignell from the United States, and um, Maita El Memari, who is coming from the United Arab Emirates. Meanwhile, we have contributors, uh, Eric Shanushek, who is sitting here, who is from the Hoover Institute from Stanford University in the US. We also have Pam Grossman, the Dean of Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. So these are all the names that are going to appear in the afternoon, but for the very first panel, let's have onto the stage uh, Danian, Ms. Weiguan, from Zhengda Jituan, our Zhengda Jituan Chief. And also we have uh, David. Let's come up to the stage. Meanwhile, let's have the expert. Pam, shall we? Also, the young leaders, Maita El Mamari, and Dani, as well as Jesse and Duncan. Can we have all of them? Now, there is the issue of the seating. So all of you have an option to come up to the stage. Right now, I think we have enough seats for the third panel, right? Is it enough? I can just stand here. <coughs> Please. Why don't we sit one young leader, one business leader? Is that OK? Yeah. Can we do that? Would that be a, agreed? OK. Um, can, we, can we change? Yes. 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 Now, my job is not to say too much. I've already said too much. My job is to be the bridge between a conversation happened among the two groups. 
So why don't we start from our young leaders? They have prepared brilliant questions yesterday already. So let's have the first lady to speak. What are the questions you want to ask, in a way? Follow up this morning's conversation, please. Sure. Um, so we've, we've seen a lot of reports from the World Economic Forum, um, as well as the OECD talking about the 21st century skills, the creative thinking, the critical thinking, um, and all these transferable skills that have become a buzzword um, in a lot of educational institutions, as well as businesses, when they're asking for what are the requirements um, of students who are graduating and entering the labor force. And so my question is, what skills will business need over the year? And I know these skills have been mentioned, but how are those skills developed in your opinion? And are they developed before entering the business? Are they developed during um, the fresh graduates years throughout the business? As well as, are these skills really transferable? Because we talk a lot about adaptability and the changing labor force. What, how accurate is, um, are these skills representation and transferability, I guess, into these different fields? Okay. Shall we have David to answer that question first of all? Sorry, this is the only conference I have to move my chair onto the stage, so I did exactly that. I missed maybe some of the part you said briefly, but David, go ahead. Uh, uh, David Crookshank from Deloitte. We recruit about 90,000 people a year, and 45,000 of them we train through our various training programs, whether as consultants, actuaries, um, tax advisors, auditors, and a whole range of other professions as well um, and I think I just say yes to your question uh, I think we yes we look for students with strong academics but they can come from just about any discipline um, we look for people who've got strong uh, analytical skills numerical skills skills with language uh, problem-solving skills uh, ability to work in teams ability to express themselves orally and in written communication and all of those are important and I don't think any one can be a substitute for the other and you know we test for those when people come in to answer your question you know we we, we test at entry level uh, whether people have sufficient of those skills but I do think the skills are being developed all the time I don't think you know we recruit people as finished products either from school we recruit from schools and from universities uh, because we do expect that part of our role is the development of those people and those skills and so um, to suit the environment that, that that we have so we do a huge amount of training and development but if we've got um, we have to have the raw material to work with there and I think that ability to think creatively problem solve um, express different points of view challenge um, is, is very, very important. The academics have to be there, but I think all the other bits have to be there as well. And I think they are transferable, because I can't think of any occupation now where those skills aren't required in, in, in some degree. But my interest, I wonder, really, are you trying to seek a job with David? <laughs> or actually, you're asking the question on behalf of your generation. I think your responsibility would be latter, right? Yeah. Um, from my limited experience with work placements is that you have these institutions that recruit high caliber students for their creativity and for their talent and their innovation. Um, yet when they join their organizations, whether it be academic institutions, consultancy companies, whatever organization it is, there tends to be um, a tendency within those organizations, even though they recruited those fresh graduates for their innovation and creativity and talent, to limit that talent and to retrain them, to repurpose them, to kind of be a clog in the big machine. Um, and so my, my question, I guess, is for everyone rather than just, just David is, how do we create more uh, collaboration between business and education to continue harnessing that innovation and creativity? Because I feel like through my higher education journey, I had a really um, like outgoing personality and, and that was cultivated by the community that I was in. I was always encouraged to think outside the box and you had the facilities in that limited um, higher education institution to actually execute those ideas. But then you join the labor force and you're limited by bureaucracy and by how things are always done the same way and so 
we recruited you because you're talented, but you're supposed to fit the whatever is currently happening. <laughs> That's a very good challenge. <laughs> David, did uh, you have the same trouble when you got out of the school? Um, I'll, I'll come back to that. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, 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 the challenge, though, of you know, do we take people who are bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, can conquer the world and solve all the problems, and then try and turn them into robots uh, to make them do very routine tasks? There is a bit of that, I have to say. I hope it's not being recorded too much. But there is a bit of that at the early stages. There are base professional skills that we require everybody to learn. There are, in many cases, professional exams that need to be passed. So there is a... There's a degree of standardization in that. But what we try and do is, as early as possible, open that up so that people can flower, that they can demonstrate all the skills they've got. And usually in an environment like ours, if you reach up, the opportunities are there because everybody wants people to grow fast. And so if you reach up, you will nearly always find that somebody will give you a break. So just, just ask. You must I, I demand that ask, demand. Did you survive all of this also at the very beginning yeah, no, I, of your I, career? I think back to my training. Uh, some of it um, was a bit boring. Um, and, you know, some of it was not that exciting. But there was always enough there that excited me. And I got to do enough interesting and challenging work to compensate for the bits that, yeah, I didn't think was so interesting. But you... you, you ha what you were the interesting... Because we don't want to talk about generally. We want to talk about specifically. Because otherwise, everything has been explored. All the right things have been said. But the thing is, we need case studies. We need real experiences. We need how you survive and thrive, and how the others could also do in a very different circumstances. If I could, my job is to push, Michael told me. I, I shouldn't hog the microphone for too long. Yes, but I think, right. I think, uh, I think <laughs> And uh, then we we'll move on to the do, others. Doing things that other people hadn't done, being first, uh, to create, uh, create solutions to problems. I've always loved dealing with very complex problems. Um, so find, to find answers that other people hadn't been able to find, uh, to design processes, design ways of doing things that were better, um, and uh, you know, to, see, to see in the end uh, the, the output from us is to help clients succeed where um, you know, they can be better than their competitors. So it's always to try and find ways of being out in front and being, being creative and innovative around the approaches that we took to dealing with problems or, or um, you know, doing work for clients. That, that was the bit that turned me on. Turned me on. That's why I, still, I stayed with Deloitte for a long time, uh, just about 40 years. So. Matthias, I'm not sure whether you are satisfied with that. If not, we'll come back to David later, yeah. okay? <laughs> <laughs> Danny. Let me play the game of the other way around, so we'll get Pam really to say something about specific issues and specific case studies. Um, can we know, first of all, of Pam maybe, what kind of aspirations did she have when she got, of the uh, got out of university? And what kinds of values did she desire at the very beginning of her career? And whether those have eventually realized or not so that then we can invite your questions which to based on what her experience are, okay? Can we do that, Pam? Yeah, sure. We have to be specific. <laughs> so I went to university to become a high school English teacher. That was my goal. Uh, I went to an excellent liberal arts college, so I uh, developed a lot of the written communication, a lot of the skills that you mentioned. Um, and along with the bachelor's in English, I also got a teaching credential and taught for eight years in high school. And I would say that everything I learned as a teacher has been enormously useful in my role now as an academic leader. I, I often say that I draw most on my experience as a teacher in my new role as a dean. I didn't set out to become a dean. Um, I really loved teaching, have always loved teaching, loved being a professor, loved doing research. But like you, I enjoy solving problems. I enjoy thinking organizationally. Um, I enjoy supporting the learning of others. And so becoming a, a dean of a college has been enormously satisfying. But when I think about the work that I do, so much of it uh, draws back on my experience as a teacher, the ability to explain, the ability to create bridges between what somebody understands and where I'm trying to get people. Um, 
the designing a faculty meeting is a little bit like designing a lesson plan, right? What are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to get there? So I feel like a lot of the experiences I've had have really drawn on that. What's interesting in higher education, and I'd be curious about other people's responses to this, is that we require higher education for virtually every profession, except for higher education. So I became a dean without a degree in leadership in higher education or certification in that. And so much of it you're learning along the way. Much of it you're drawing on experience, learning from others. Um, so it is very much experiential learning rather than formal preparation. Yes, uh, thank you so much. It's definitely an honor to be sitting next to you since I am an alumni <laughs> of uh, the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education. And I love that you touched on experiential learning. So in the introductory remarks, um, it was really enlightening to see growth mindset on this slide many, many different times. And I am a product of an interdisciplinary master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania in the Graduate School of Education that really allowed me to build skills that I am using on this stage right now. Complex problem solving skills, public speaking skills, using actually community-based programs to interact with leaders in education, in the nonprofit world, in business, so that I was being set up for success in school so that I could succeed in the workforce um, afterwards. However, from working with different educational institutions, I've seen that the institution of education itself is actually a fixed mindset. And there are exceptions to that rule. So I ask you, um, what recommendations do you have for other institutions to allow for more of a growth mindset, to allow cooperation, more cooperation with businesses um, for the benefit of the future workforce? Mm -hmm. Danny, just a footnote before we go to Pam for the answer. You might want to share with our audience as to what you are doing right now because that's in a way related to your question. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I am a lifelong learner and um, I actually run a social impact incubator that's based out of UC Berkeley. And what we do is we equip both undergraduate and graduate students with funding, mentorship, and skills-based development so that they can take the idea that they've learned in their classroom and scale them in the real world. And I developed that training through my education at Penn. So it is an incredible honor and privilege that I am allowed to take that training I learned at Penn and then translate it at UC Berkeley. And the interesting caveat about the program at UC Berkeley is that you are allowed to create teams where only one individual has to be a student because we believe intrinsically that diverse perspectives create the most sustainable, successful solutions. Okay, besides this beautiful Penn alumni reunion. Let's answer the question. <laughs> Go ahead with the question. The institution not work very well, especially educational institution. That's from then. So I, I'm so glad that you highlighted some of the strengths of the International Education Development Program at Penn because I think it is a good model along with our, a master's in educational entrepreneurship of what education can be. So both of those two master's programs include a lot of experiential learning that's coupled with the more academic learning. So in the case of the program you graduated for, there's a several months long internship um, where people are placed globally. So people may, could be working anywhere around the world using the skills they had developed in the classroom, learning new skills along the way, and then bringing that learning back to the classroom in the fall. The educational entrepreneurship model is designed to actually prepare people for incubators like yours to really support both educators and business people to think of new solutions through entrepreneurship. Um, may and I? May I just come in here because we love a business, uh, how shall I say, we love education institution in University of Pennsylvania, but we are talking about a much bigger issue than just the educational institution there, but rather globally. So the example, you wanted specifics yeah. though. So the specifics are that these programs are designed to do something that many programs are not which is to marry experiential learning with academic learning. To not say it's either or, to not say you learn everything by running, going out and starting a business yourself, 
but that you can marry that learning from a wide variety of perspectives. And I think often in higher ed, we think of most of the learning happening within the classroom, within course units, within credits, and aren't thinking hard enough about how to marry that with the actual skills that people need to, de be, de, uh, to develop to be successful in those arenas. So models that do more of that blending, I think, are often more successful in preparing people for the workplace. Um, let's go to the other one. Yeah. Um, I want to share an example of mine so that we can really start the real conversation. Um, Sometimes the host has to make a, um, a comedian of herself in order to do that. Um, I graduated from a no one knows university in China. But on my memories of my university days, I shared over the lunch table with our friends is several things. Now, I started a rock and roll music radio on campus. At that time in China, rock and roll was still not that much accessible, but anyway. S secondly, there was a, the fourth women's conference being held in China at that time. The very first time women from all over the world come to my country. And for me, it was an eye-opening experience to interact with so many people from so many different cultures. Thirdly, for one half year, I have an American roommate. I remember her name, Miss Katie Saldarini, coming from South Carolina. And we were roommates, and she shared with me all the wonderful life and experiences she had, and of course mine with her. And, I, and she taught me about the dating skills as well, but it didn't work in China context, <laughs> I can tell you. And the last thing I remember is there is a big library in my university, despite of the fact it is not well known. And the president of my university used to be working at the United Nations. In other words, he taught me a lot about stories from the other world, in a way, quote unquote. So that's the four things I remember from my university days. And I think, in a way, it probably going to the root of the kinds of discussion we have about education and the workplace. Um, I love my teachers. They were great to me. They were very experienced, very kind. But I don't remember very well what they taught me. But no offense, I love them utmost. But here is the thing that we are talking about education. And I am a passionate, long-retired university student. But I think the topic is evergreen with us, particularly right now. So why don't I give the microphone to the real young leader sitting here and ask him to ask the real question to Mr. Cheravanot. Because Mr. Cheravanot is a very open-minded person. I know that from my childhood. So go ahead and ask the question. Yes, so uh, continue with Ms. Tianwei's case, her story. Actually, I'm pretty different from Ms. Tianwei. Actually, uh, I came from uh, Cornell University. I just graduated the past summer. Cornell is one of the Ivy League schools in America. It's pretty well known. And uh, back to China, I was in the Beijing Number 4 High School, which is also one of the top high school in China. But I think I did learn a lot from my teachers from these schools. Uh, I'm not a generic good student in China because I'm not doing that well in the classroom or on the examinations. But I'm very active in all of these students' activities, extracurricular activities. I was the student union president when I was in high school. And I was the president of Chinese Student Association in uh, Cornell. But what I think the universities or my high school aren't doing well is that I do a lot out of school for the social activities, but I still think I'm not prepared to start my career. I have no good vocational education when I was in college or in high school. So I, I just heard about uh, Mr. Cruikshank said uh, Deloitte is spending a lot of money to train their employees to be suitable for the works of Deloitte. But I think, is that the job of universities? 
why companies are spending their money? Because I know uh, Mr. Chiravanant has more than 200,000 of employees in your company. Is that a problem you are facing about universities are not providing good vocational education for students and companies need to do universities work to train students to be ready for jobs and the society.在做的事情呢，就是靠大学毕业生，但是还是又在培训。我们的培训的方法就是用实际去工作，实际从实掌中呢得到经验。我们培训的人才什么呢？是领导人才。我们不是不培培训一般的员工，因为下去一般的员工
，我们集团用了三十几万人。现在我们整个在改革，怎么改革呢？就是不要去把老的体制毁灭掉，先推翻，就是用新的人才去做新的事情，但是用老的事事业给他们去创新，所以。以后来影响我们老的事业，给他们学到。你现在叫他，他做了不说他不好，他赚钱，你说不好吗？但是我们这个年轻人一做做了赚钱比他还好，这这样来改革我们集团的这个整个变化。嗯 ，You talk about three things. It seems one is to learn from failure, the capabilities. Secondly. Is to have a holistic approach of kind of talents that you can churn out from university or educational systems. Thirdly, you are talking about a parallel system going on within your business on how to nurture the young employees' failure and learn from failure. Do you think, though, you have learned about that in university? If not, what what can we connect the two world? Yes.、Uh I think Mr. Charavnod's company provides a really good training program or education program for the young employees to make them be capable of being leaders and embrace the technological changes in the modern society. But、uh, I think、uh, the universities or college still lack of these kinds of vocational、uh, fostering or education, and that's why I think we are holding this forum. To let the business leaders connect with the educational leaders, and probably the most viable solution is universities can work with companies probably to have a new system of helping students adapt to the society and adapt their career. Because I just walk out college, I am struggling with knowing everything in China. Because I study in America, I know basically nothing about. American professional world, and I know absolutely nothing about Chinese professional world. I think if there is a system connecting business sectors, private sectors with the educational sectors, it, it sounds very attractive to me because、uh, I really need it right now. <laughs> Can you answer that? Can you answer that? I think. That we are in a world now where there aren't sharp divides between the world of education and the world of business, and I think people are going to be re-educated, re-educate themselves many, many times over their careers for different options. I, I give, you, give you an example.、Uh, we do, my firm Deloitte, does a millennial survey every year、uh, of employees of all companies from around the world. It's a big survey, about 14,000 people, and we've been doing it for about 10 years. So, it's quite interesting looking at the trends in there. But this this past year, we asked the question about the fourth industrial revolution, and we asked millennials, "What do you think the fourth industrial revolution means for your jobs?" Half of them said, "No problem at all. Great, because it's going to enhance our our jobs. We can do our jobs better because of it." 25% thought it didn't make any difference. I'm not sure who they were, but that's、uh, they, that was the response. And the remaining 25% said they were worried because they thought that there was a risk that some of their jobs could be automated and they could、uh, find themselves out of work. However, the most interesting bit to overlay on that is 70% of that whole population said. They didn't think that their skills in digital would be enough to see them through the next five, ten, fifteen years. They need more training, more skilling, and so on. So I think we are, you know, we're in a world now where the, the, the skills that people require, the the education they require, is going to change and develop all the time.、And、I think some of the challenges for universities and colleges and even schools is, you know, how do you make That process more continuous. How do employers engage with、um, educational institutions to make it a more continuous process? Because it's, you know, when I started, I think most people thought, well, you went to university once at the beginning of your career, and that was it. I, I think we're going to be moving into a very, very different. We've already moved into a very different world from that. And I、mm. think how, how do we make it more continuous and get more of that engagement? What David said to me is kind of worrisome in a way that businesses have realised well. The educational institutions—they don't turn out the right talents. We have to do it ourselves. It seems that you're trying to say exactly that. And also, I think Mr. Chairwoman Nant 
also suggested that in a way, in a very polite way, of course. So, uh, what is the what is the lack of the connection between the two worlds? Pam, I want to come back to you. Don't praise the uh, education <laughs> institution or Pennsylvania University again. Tell us what are the problems. As an educator, do you have a roadmap? Do you have a roadmap? I think this question of the relationship between universities and jobs is a very complicated one. And I agree with David that this is evolving and changing. I think the notion of universities preparing people very specifically for vocations is problematic because the jobs are going to change, as we just heard. Jobs are going to continually evolve. Most of you will have many jobs requiring different skills. Building? So I think the focus on some of these skills that we talked about earlier that are transferable uh, around communication, around collaboration, around the ability to learn, complex solving problem, are some of the skills that you can develop in universities that are transferable across a range of job possibilities, but also support the continuation of learning, which I think is going to be a reality uh, for most of us in terms of what the future looks like. We're constantly going to be learning new things. So I think creating both K-12 schooling and university schooling that are adapted to those skills and assessing those skills, holding universities and schools accountable for teaching those things will be part of the solution. The other part is that increasingly corporations are doing some of their own, creating their own uh, learning and training institutes, substituting for universities where they feel like it hasn't been, they haven't developed those skills. Mm. So I think universities are going to feel that pressure. Mm. You know, I just want to have a brief observation before David speak. Sure. When you were speaking, the other students were going like, the other two business leaders were so their facial expression does say something. So let's have David to respond to that from the business leaders uh, to the educators. Uh, yeah, and I really, I, I don't, I really don't think it's an either-or thing. I do think that you know universities and colleges um, are a very special environment for people to develop their thinking, work out um, you know where their weaknesses are, their strengths are, um, learn to work with other people, learn to work across discipline test themselves, fail sometimes, I think they have a very special place. So I don't see businesses substituting for the universities, but what I do see is uh, some of the learnings of both being exchanged and it being a more continuous process, if you like, throughout all our, all our lifetimes because, uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I think it's... Uh, Continuous learning and development is something everybody's going to have to get used to. And you know, there's many examples actually around the world where people have been taken back back from the uh, you know, working mums. I think in Korea, there's a wonderful example actually. A whole bunch of them taken back, no digital skills at all, and they were taught to be computer programmers. A whole group of them, I think, age about 55, and they all went on to work in the workplace. And they that was an example of a business, university, college collaboration. And so I think we you know, we have to experiment a lot more because the pace of change is huge, and just pretending that old models were good for us won't work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair of Anant, and then we'll have the young leaders to speak up. Thank Sweetchan 一出来一毕业呢所以这个旧财呢还是不是永久不变的
，你这个教材如果老化以后，你培养出来的学生已经过了时代了，所以是不适合于大企业家所有的。连这下去的这个创业者呢，马云主席他讲，未来呢，企业家是剩呃千万，嗯，算一。不是垄断在这个大公司里面，因为有了互联网，他可以把他的产品呢销售，经过这互互联网销售到全世界去。所以大学应该来了解一下，那未来工作人员会来越来越少，为什么全部用智能、用软件代替人工，连工人下去都没有，用机器人代替，连农民也没有了。就是用机器代替农民，所以下去的人应该做什么？什么是他们就业机会的最好？那大学就要教这些人才出来可以用。Okay. 嗯 ，Pam, you want to briefly respond to Mr. Chair one not just said? I'm not saying you are here representing all the universities, but rather as an educator, how do you see? How can we really connect the dots? Can we do it better this time? Uh, briefly, please, and then I go to the young leaders. Well, I'll be curious to hear what the young leaders have to say about yeah. this. I certainly think you're right that uh, universities need to be responsive. They need to understand what it is that both uh, businesses are looking for, but also what young people are looking for. But the but thing I is tend how. To agree, the hard thing is how. But I tend to agree, though, that universities are not the same as businesses. Ultimately, they have a special function in terms of education that is a broader function around education than training functions of a company. So I don't see them as being exactly the same. I think the trick is how do they communicate and collaborate more effectively. Mm. Mm. Well said, thank you. Now let's go to the young people, quote unquote. Uh, I want to be part of you, but you know. We will have you to speak about your mind. Uh, before you start, uh, Danny, let me say that recently people have been helping me to see the next generation, quote unquote, so different from the earlier generations in the fact that the current generation sitting with us on the stage, the three of them, are living in a world in which they see both physical world and the virtual world from the very early age of their life. None of us did that when we were very young. So the way they think and the way they look at things, the way they absorb and learn could be quite different from our path too. Now, the question really is now, and I want to just speak about this, what would be the suggestions that you have for us about the values and the skills and the way of doing things when it comes to education, given the uniqueness uh, of your generation, if I could. Oh, that's a, it's a very good question. A good question. I'll have the three of you all um, to say something. And uh, thank you for thinking that I am very, very young, but I actually uh, am a little older where I did have a part of my life up until high school where I, I didn't have an internet connection in my house. Um, and when I went to university, I like to call the millennial generation the in limbo generation because you have digital immigrants, um, older individuals that have learned later on in their life how to adopt technological practices. And then you have digital natives, so people that were born after me that always had technology as an integral part of their life. And I see technology as both a tool and a crutch. I think that we can rely on older leaders to help us better understand how technology can be used, but how we can fall on best practices of before. But I also think we need to teach young leaders through education how to not be so dependent on technology. Oh. Um, what I saw in the PISA results is that although, um, and speaking as an American, although Americans are having higher performance, they are citing that they are not feeling that good about themselves. Burnout, overexposure to technology, I think, is making them feel more isolated. So taking specific steps to take what I call a digital detox, having particular conversations in classrooms where you are forced to look people in the eye when you talk to them and to listen to them actively, I think is 
is imperative for the future because if we do not learn how to communicate with humans, then I believe we are basically uh, approaching a doom. So as technology advances and as we are building robots and AI to take over, let us remind ourselves that we are building these robots. Mm -hmm. So we have the power to change them and make them work and humans are always going to be involved. And so I'm curious to hear from both the young leaders and the business leaders, what particular tools and actions would you take now to make sure that that symbiotic relationship with technology in the future is more sustainable? Mm, great question and certainly a great perspective too. Maita, please speak out about this too. Sure. Um, before I start to that, I think there, there are two things that I feel like are missing in our, in our conversation. One was brought up by Dean Pam, which is, what is the purpose of education? Is the sole purpose of higher education to prepare um, students to join the labor market? Or is it a self-exploration um, opportunity? Is it an opportunity to uh, learn civic engagement? What is the purpose of higher education? And I think that takes many forms, and there is not one What's purpose. your answer? Because we want to hear your, what your voice is. <laughs> Well, I had a liberal arts education, and I, I really enjoyed that. I think it was a self-exploring purpose, um, and that opportunity allowed me to really explore what fields does Metha like, what global problems does Metha want to solve. And I think that type of education is the type of education that helps students stay engaged um, rather than burn out and kind of feel like overflow of information, studying philosophy, <laughs> technology, whatever it is. You're learning about something with the purpose of contributing. Um, and that contribution doesn't necessarily mean um, employment, but it can also mean kind of what Jesse talked about, this informal education through student activities and social activities. And that's my second point. I think we haven't discussed how informal education actually helps build these critical thinking, um, problem solving skills, and they're just as important as formal education. Um, and to answer your question of like how do we create the, the solution, or my suggestion, I guess, is you start really early on. I feel like in my higher education experience, I had a lot of um, collaborative experiences where I, I worked with organizations, and I was having kind of the academic and the theory being taught in my, in my higher education. But I wished I did that earlier, like in my high school, or when I was starting to form these interests and these skills, because my high school was very narrow. Um, you had to pass the SATs, you had the national examinations, and then I went to higher education, and I didn't feel like I even had the skill set to, to, to be able to excel in that environment. And I think there needs to be a broader conversation of how we can create collaboration between the K-12 higher education, if necessary, as well as incorporating vo vocational education, looking at other um, education forms and not necessarily just the teacher-classroom collaboration. And my last point is I think we live in a globalized world. And that's one thing that I also kind of missed in this discussion is there's a global economy that we're working with. And that's, I think you pointed at it as well as the biggest difference is that we, uh, growing up in this generation, I think is you feel a sense of interconnectedness even if you're not physically next to each other. You feel a sense of responsibility and awareness and you have an impact beyond the borders of your nation or your state or your community. You have the opportunity to have global impact through this technology that um, we use as a tool. And so how can we incorporate that into our education systems as well. Yes, uh, speaking of my generation, I was born in 1997 in China. So uh, I was born with internet. The economy is good in China since my childhood. Technology are accessible from my childhood. We are actually... In the big city. Yes, yes, Beijing is yeah, absolutely big city. Rural areas. Yes, so um, actually, I am born with a combination of virtual world and the reality. So um, I think virtual world technologies are like opportunities for us, but also like traps for us. For my generation, in our education, we didn't give that much value on literature, on history, or humanity studies as before. I know my parents or my cousins, they don't have that good access to technologies, but they give more time on reading histories, reading classics, but not my generation. My best friend since childhood is Game Boy, and then iPhone 4, and then iPhone 5, and then now it's Huawei. So 
we, we are not that close to literature or humanity. I remember what Jack Ma said today morning is that in the future, it will be an era of coexistence of machine and human. And human needs to distinct themselves from machines. And I think what can distinguish them is our humanity, our compassion, our understanding of past, of history, of classics. And those are the brightest spots of human being, I think. I think that's why I believe technologies can be a trap for human being. For my generation is that it is taking away our time to spending with our families, to knowing each other, to walking out of our comfort zone to know more about who we are. Um, I think that's, uh, that, that's my opinion on my generation. Yeah, but as we know, technologies are neutral. Yes. So it really depends on how we take advantage of the technologies and in what way. So in that regard, let's come back to our topic, which is not about technology, but rather about education. And as to how would you link the latest with the technologies and the impact it had on you together with the kind of future of education we want. So any specific suggestion in that regard, Jesse, before we move on to the other speakers? Yes, uh, you mean any specific suggestions for? for what you have just said, all yes. the problems. Yes, um, actually I, I just know about the problems. I don't have a <laughs> viable solutions suggested for the topic. But um, from my perspective, I think in order to combat with machines, first we need to embrace the technology change. We need to understand the cutting edge technologies, the cutting edge sciences. I know uh, the, the tax trend report for Deloitte in the year 2017, the title is the kinetic enterprises. So enterprises are being kinetic to adopt the era. I think maybe talents needs to also understand the changes of technology. And I think that's the first step. And the second step is, I think we need to connect more with other nations, other cultures. We need to break the boundaries of subjects, of cultures. And I think that's why we're having this forum right now. We have uh, Chinese representatives, we have Europe uh, representatives, we have people from US colleges. We are wearing this translator to understand each other, go beyond the language. I think that's a good start for me. Probably the solution I suggested is the first step is more conference like that. Okay, we hope, we hope. I, hope, I think we hope. <laughs> okay, please. Yeah, absolutely, I would love to add to that. See, if you ask the young people to speak up, they're really going to speak up. <laughs> <laughs> well, so with climate after another round, we go to the others to respond to you, okay? Yeah. Um, I would say that international education has been incredibly valuable for me and what I was talking with the young leaders before is that even though I've had very interesting, unique um, educational experiences that were offered through the public education system that allowed me to grow and have a growth mindset, I also learned so much from the countries that I had the privilege of working and learning in. And what I think is very important to note is that no one country has all of the solutions for business and all of the solutions for education. In China, I see many practices that I'm envious of because of the rigor, and yet I also see the breadth of education that we really apply in the United States to be very advantageous. And so I feel like the, co the best combination is when you can have experiences from many different cultures and different worlds. And so having the future of education and this forum for world education is one step in the right direction, but my concern is that the conversation stops here. So what I ask business leaders and education leaders is what concrete steps can we take today to make sure that education and business truly has no borders, because also in light of climate change, I feel like we have to take down those physical borders that we have in order mm. to unite for our um, survival. And we shouldn't let it just remain in rhetorics, exactly. but in actions and real achievements. Um, David, you want to come back on this? Just a couple of points. Actually, first one, uh, you know, I was just listening to the discussion about uh, AI and robotics and uh, machine learning and so on. And of course, humans teach the machines. Humans 
program the algorithms and humans provide the incentives for what the algorithms should achieve. And clearly, if the algorithms are designed to achieve bad outcomes, guess what? The robots will achieve bad outcomes. So I think humans have more uh, oversight, input into the control of what goes on with machine learning and robotics than maybe, maybe you know, we, we, we think sometimes. If I just move outside the world of D Deloitte, just a couple of reference points to the links between school and business. Um, two years ago, the World Economic Forum did a a huge survey actually around the world and they looked at uh, the future of jobs and they estimated that 65% of children entering primary school two years ago would go into jobs that didn't exist today. Mm. Now, if that number is 60%, 55%, it doesn't really matter, but it's a huge number. And so I, I think one of the things I, I, I said outside Deloitte, I, I chair the trustees of a small charity in the UK that spends its entire time getting people from the world of work into the world of schools to improve the dialogue, if you like, and to open the eyes of school students and sometimes teachers as to well, the way the world of work is changing. And indeed, some of the teachers use some of the learnings from those talks, not to train their students for the world of work, because I agree that's not the purpose of education, but it's to inform the students about why some of the things they're learning could be important, depending on choices that they made later on in their life. And I think there is you know, with the pace of change that's going on in the world at the moment, which is certainly in my career, I've never seen the, the, the pace being faster. The pace of change is going on. Nobody has all the answers, and I agree with all the comments about, you know, we share all these problems around the world because I think there's no boundaries around some of these, uh, some of these challenges. But I think the more physical connections of getting humans into schools from the world of work, partic particularly in the newer industries and so on, to talk about what they do, I think it opens the eyes of, 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 of students and also teachers to some of the possibilities. And I think it enriches some of the educational outputs that come. Mm. Mr. Tara Van Nott, would you like to also provide your input? Well, again, we <coughs> took a Xiao 这个工具在企业也可以用到什么事业都可以用在教育方面也可以用比如养成教育小房间里面去教几十个人生产还有使用它我用了高科技来改革我这个实体经济跟虚拟经济结合所以我的我们的事业会进步的很快产量也会大大的提升品质提升价钱便宜一到最后你的产品是无有原理是 Thank you Mr. Tara Van Nott Pam, it seems that this gentleman is trying to suggest if you don't update the educational system yourself, you're going to lose your job in the future <laughs> because the kids are going to run away from schools and they can learn it somewhere else. Yeah, respond to that before we wrap it up. 
Well, I, I think technology, as you say, is a part of our lives, and it's a part of education, and increasingly we'll use it as a tool, as an additional tool. We heard a lot about personalized learning this morning. Um, I think one of the questions is to what extent do we have the research that supports that kind of differentiation? So one plug I'll put in is for more educational research on some of these innovations and the ways we use technology. We heard calls for more experimentation and coupled with the experimentation should be more rigorous research to find out what works and for whom and under what conditions. Because I think technology is a part of life. I think we're going to be using it more and more in everything we do and learning more about how it can be effective in supporting learning. There's lots of online learning, but we also know that not everybody learns well that way. So how do we, again, learn from the vast kind of experimentation that's going on right now mm. in terms of the use of technology to improve the quality of learning? Okay. We started a bit late for this session, so we wrap it up a little bit later than earlier planned. But before we go, I want to have every one of you, not a whole paragraph, not a whole sentence even, just one key word that you think would be important for all of us to ponder upon after this discussion. David, since I started with you at the very start, why don't I do that at the very end also? I firmly believe in collaboration between schools, employers, educators, and businesses, and uh, creating better understandings, not mm. to confuse the boundaries between the two, because as I said earlier, they have different roles. But I think there's a richness that can come out of that collaboration, which I, I would like to see. And I think our younger speakers have talked very eloquently about that this afternoon. Collaboration. Next. Building on that, I guess, collaboration with an aspect of diversity and at a global lens. Okay, Pam? I think there's a consensus here. I would also say more communication and collaboration across these boundaries, both between institutions and across nations. Mm. CNC, communication, collaboration. I hate to say collaboration again, but oh. using strengths-based leadership for, so allowing education to do what they're best and then allowing businesses to do what they're best and working together to really create uh, sustainable solutions. Thank you. I was I would say the world uh kinetic. We need to keep changing with the world. School needs to keep changing. Uh, also uh they always need to listen to the suggestions of the companies. Mm. I think that's why we need to be kinetic. That's mm. it. Okay, since we have the young leaders pretty much as the main leading roles on the stage, I want to get them some scores of the adults, quote unquote, you are talking to. Can they pass the test or they fail the test, at least for this discussion? Would you say pass, then you raise your hand? Did they pass the test? taught that we shouldn't be using exams to Oh, check yes, you got me there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. Now you guys survived, should I say. Okay, let's have, bring a warm round of applause for all the people on the stage. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. I want to follow up with the second panel. We've already set some quite fired up stage <laughs> for all of you. Watch out. Yeah. And should we have all of the members of the second panel to come up to the stage? We will have Daniel, Jerry, and we also have Eric. Meanwhile, Danny, once again, and Damien, as well as Jesse, I think that is the one that I got here. Yes, please. Let's one young leader and one uh, business leader and opinion leaders. Yes, you're back again. I think it's also your name here. Okay, 
I was told that the second panel will be even more exciting. No offense to the first panel, by the way. So people don't go away. Now, let's go to the second panel. Let's meet the young people first. Can we do that? Because there are one new player here, right? The other two have already spoken. Let's go with you first. Who you are, what you do, why you are here, what's important. OK, so my name is Damien Boselager. Um, I was working in the private sector, so I can connect uh, to the business world, I guess. And then um, in 2016, I saw that we had a rise of right-wing populism across Europe. and. Um, we also had a bit of an unfortunate election, at least from my perspective, in the United States, where I was studying at that time. And that made uh, me and um, two uh, fellow Europeans, an Italian man and a French woman, think that maybe we, it's time to uh, build a European party that counters the more nationalistic focus with the European perspective. And so um, we did that, and then we ran for the European Parliament elections out of eight countries, and we won one seat, which is the one I am sitting on in the European Parliament. And um, my connection to education is that I have uh, many thoughts about them which are very naive, um, which I will be happy to share with you, but I am not an expert in the field. I think the only uh, real conviction I have is to go back to school when I'm 50 or 55 to give back uh, to young students uh, with what I learned until then. We were told, quote unquote, uh, this morning by a lot of uh, the speakers that there's nothing like naivete, mm, which you mentioned. So we are willing to hear your input here. Okay? Thank you. As long as you have one seat, it's already very important for the vote. Um, let's go with uh, Mr. Lee. Uh, I want you to have an early a response to the earlier discussion and also the, some of the questions that the young leaders have posed already. One is about, it's such a globalized world, how come education system right now is not providing us with all the access to different facets of this world? Secondly, about technology and also the realities of education. And thirdly, about, uh, we have one inspiring young leader on the stage who is trying to make a difference in political life, which is, very difficult these days. Now, he talk about naivete, but I'm sure when he vote, he wouldn't think about that way. So uh, how would you, you know, comment on some of these important points already being mentioned? Go ahead. I'm glad I have a half hour to answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with the politics, because I just started an organization that focuses on using um, education from a political perspective. And what I would say is I think um, there's a large group of people, both who have good educations and who don't, but would like one, um, who find that education is more and more critical. And I think as you see in um, democratic countries, the opportunity to um, build voter constituencies around education you'll see bigger changes in education. In terms of um, technology, so I don't know how many people here know Kai Ming Chang, um, but I'll channel him for a minute. He lives in Hong Kong, and I think he would say, you know, learning is a human instinct. Education is, is a system. And so, um, and so over the last 30 years, we've really learned tremendous amounts about how people learn. We've probably learned more in the last 30 years than the previous one or 200 years. And we don't really, um, have not yet put that into action because I think we see a system that's based on accountability and not on improvement. Can we be specific? What exactly did we learn over the past few uh, decades that you think can be tapped into the educational system, the kind of education you just talked about? So to name three or four very specific things, the low-hanging fruit, for instance, is early childhood education um, and alleviating the issues of uh, poverty and violence. I mean, I would start by saying eliminating poverty, violence, making people feel supported is probably number one. Number two is early childhood. You know, using the U.S. context, I would say um, summer learning loss for poor kids. And then I would say... Um, the importance of having exercise for the brain. And then if we wanted to focus on reading, um, 
number one is, and this is for alphabet-oriented languages, um, the importance of phonics um, and general knowledge, because the research would show that um, if you look at kids who have good coding skills but poor um, general knowledge, when you look at how they perform in high school, um, the kids with general knowledge do better than the kids who had um, good coding skills. Okay. So since you mentioned a bit the political perspective, um, once uh, like I listened to the discussions uh, over the day and also in the previous panel, I was thinking a bit about you know the questions that were asked in terms of what is the purpose of education and what is the role that each of the different sectors plays in this. And I think uh, there's apparently uh, a lot of interest to interconnect and collaborate across the sectors, public sector and private sector, which is good. But I think we should also understand that there are different uh, primary purposes for these two sectors when educating. So um, when I think about the public sector's responsibility in education, I think about how to, um, let's say, educate to have good and, you know, values-driven citizens. Whereas when I think from the business side, it's probably more about the question of how do I get an asset, a human capital that works maybe in a very creative and adaptive way, but it's still it's a different kind of a angle to it. And therefore, I think um, if we also believe that our own, that like one value of education is critical thought and uh, challenging our own beliefs, I think one of the uh, like key questions for me a bit also to, the, uh, to you on the panel is how can we, if our systems already have an idea of what a good citizen is, um, educate critical thought? And to uh, quote uh, a comedian, Timinchen, he says, like, we should take our convictions and ideas and uh, out on the porch and hit them with a cricket bat and see uh, what remains. So this is, I think, a bit my question of like, how can we maybe via exchange of, um, of ideas and, and people uh, get to like a good citizen that is critical? Uh, but I don't think you responded to um, earlier Danny's uh, comments about whether we really tapped into science discoveries in order to benefit and enrich the education right now. Any thoughts about that? If you don't, I move on to the next one. Because you also need to respond to the other people, right? You cannot just uh, ask all the questions all the time. And this is a politician speaking, by the way. <laughs> I'm kidding. I just wanted to say, I apparently already learned how to be a politician in three months. Um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, the, the question is connected to what I said, because at the moment, the, I mean, where is education policy being drafted? It's not on the EU level in my case, for example. So it is on the, on the, federal, like on the lower levels. And uh, the question there is definitely how can legislators work, learn better from um, the, the research that is being done to implement that into the system. But it's a very slow system because it's also very safeguarded against influence, I think. Danny, I will let you to further develop your thoughts a little bit. And before we move on to later. Well, the important thing in education is sort of what happens in the home and in the classroom. And I think people have the wrong way of looking um, at political systems and education. And, um, and what I mean by that is when I think of the US context, I think that people should think of the federal government at the bottom, and then you have the state level, and then you have the local level and the schools. And that's how you need to think about it, because in the end, it's all about changing what people do who deal with, with students. Um, and you can't do that. I think in the US, we proved you can't do it top down. Um, you have to build the conditions. And what I'm impressed with when I go to Singapore or um, Shanghai is you see that the idea f is teacher improvement not holding them accountable, putting, making them as effective as possible. And unless you have that type of structure, you won't get people to, you know, to adapt change. You know, the, the line anyway in the U.S. is when, in, when um, how does it go? Um, when, uh, when you have basically ideas, when you have fear, you have, when, you, when in stress, you regress. Mm. And so it has to be a positive moving system. Mm -hmm. Eric, do you have stress? Enough to change? I don't have stress. <laughs> and in fact, um, my reaction to the last panel was a little bit different. I 
was not worried at all about any of the young leaders. They're going to, they're going to be the winners and they're going to adapt. In fact, I thought that the discussion was a little bit misplaced because we're here worried about the pace of artificial intelligence and robots and so forth has virtually no effect on the future lives of the young leaders that are up here. What it does have an effect on is the people who don't go to university in the lower levels of education that uh, have been ignored in part in this discussion. Dan brought the, it up a bit, but the place where um, the rapid change, which we've seen in past eras, it maybe is faster now, but the rapid change really strikes those who don't have the basic cognitive skills to adapt to the future. The real value that comes to education comes from uh, adaptability. It's not that somebody with, uh, with a PhD can assemble a car faster. It's that they're able to adapt to different circumstances, and that's what we're facing. How to create the adaptability? As and that's the basic point, is that that's not, in general, done um, at the university level. That's done earlier when people get the basic cognitive skills that will propel them into various university fields. But there, we're talking about uh, all kinds of activities like more vocational education for uh, at the end of secondary schooling in developing countries, which I think is a very dangerous uh, activity because Developing countries, if they develop, means that things are going to change rapidly. And they, if they don't have the basic skills, are not going to be prepared uh, with very specific skills. Okay. Since we talk about the developing country, uh, Jerry, though, uh, coming from China, that's the largest developing country in the world. Of course, Jerry is coming more from the metropolitan side of China because he's working on a, uh, uh, shall we say, very high quality education. Uh, but, you know, you want to respond to that question Eric raised and also talk generally, not just in China, but also, you know, the north-south divide or even the wealth gift divide in, within one economy when it comes to resources of education. A U.S. included, I guess, in this regard also. Sure. Um, China is a very big country. Uh, it's very diversified. Uh, so you have the kind of coastal cities very well developed and also on the west side. Let's sell. Uh, many of the entrepreneurs and the business leaders in China have developed a lot of resources trying to help those uh, disadvantaged kids in, in the rural area. Uh, but of course, um, but at the end of the day. Earlier, of course, we heard from Jack. Yeah. 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 But uh, one thing Jack um, talked about earlier, which I agree that uh, if you talk about the role of university versus the industry or business, uh, I don't think, uh, personally, I don't think. Uh, the university are prepared necessarily for uh, the student for a specific job. Uh, that's not what we want. Uh, now, uh, as a uh, you know, running a business in order to hire people, I think it's very important uh, to hire people with three basic things. Well, the first one, I think, is to really have the good value. Okay? So what's right, what's wrong, what's ethical, what's uh, uh, legal, what's, uh, what to do the when to do the right thing. Okay? And that one, ironically, you don't have to learn necessarily from any university. And two, um, it's very important, it, it regardless which, where you work with, for business or government, you have to learn how to, or ha at least to work with other people, okay? And again, you don't have to learn how to work with other people necessarily at any, or any university. And the third, we talk about when we hire people, it's almost impossible to find uh, fresh graduates exactly fit into what we need as a business. Always, we always train them, but very importantly, we want to hire people or students uh, with very good ability to learn, okay? It doesn't matter what you learn, but uh, you're able to learn. So, uh, so when you come to the business, we can always train you as we need it. It doesn't matter if it's consulting or, or investment banks or auditing, whatever it is, legal, 
So you always, any companies we have you know, in the world, you, you know they have training programs for employees. So that's, if you have the ability to learn, then you, you, you can get there. Okay. So it's not, I don't think it's necessarily the university role or job to do that. But you have to, you know, you, you do have exams, so you do have dissertation. At least you have to pass all the exams and the, finish your dissertation, so you have to, you, you, you get trained to learn new things. I think that's very important. Uh, in terms of technology, um, of course, it uh, has uh, enabled uh, us to do a lot of things that uh, uh, we couldn't do in the past. Uh, I, I know a lot in China that we use online technology to, uh, to uh, help the poor kids in, 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 the, in your, uh, your area to get access to the best teachers in the big cities. The big, the, it's, uh, even though we would love to, as we discussed uh, in the morning, to send the best teachers to, to remote area villages. Honestly, it's, it's not impossible, but it's very, very hard to do. Uh, even though we love it, um, um, but uh, humans are humans. So, but uh, what you could do is, you have the best teacher, for example, in Beijing, but with the technology, we can actually have a classroom in a rural area and help them and to, to be their teachers. Which okay. I think they're doing right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, which they are doing right now. I think that's, uh, that's gonna change how uh, education can be done and in a big country like China and in other, other parts of the world as well. Okay, we have, besides this young leader on my side, we have two other young leaders. They're all eager to speak up on this matter. Then, you can go ahead. Yes, something that I, I want to bring up and I want to be delicate about this is something that I think is kind of the elephant in the room is, is how do we address ego in these challenging times? We are all leaders in some sense, but how are we truly able to cooperate if we are not able to listen to each other? So I'd say that each individual on this stage is an expert in their right mind and um, has a lot to bring to the table. But when we use loaded words like developing versus developed country, I think we start to sprinkle our own ego into the policies we want to create as if we know better than others. And so from an American standpoint, I would say in regards to climate change, we have a lot to learn. We don't necessarily need to be dictating policy as much as we need to learn from other countries on how to address our insatiable appetite for carbon and consumption. I think we have um, a lot of, we need to show um, how to be leaders, not demand that other countries and individuals do it first. So I think what I'm curious of from the more seasoned leaders on the stage is, is what practices can we employ now that these, I guess, young leaders like myself can embody for the next generation? We see the need, we see the demand, but I'm not seeing the, I don't know how to mirror it. Um, I'm not seeing it in actuality. Did I hear a silence? Okay. Well, or did I hear some answer coming up? I'll respond Eric. in one sense. The, the, one of the big problems of education policy when we talk about it is that it takes time. There's just no way to get around the fact that it's a long range, long term plan and that the immediate answers are often not very sustainable over the long run. It's that we have to build for what it looks like 20 years from now. So this morning we started discussing the sustainable development goals. That's not something that we're actually gonna solve by 2030 when the UN said we would. We're not gonna eliminate poverty and solve all of the health problems of the world by 2030. But the education that we put in place today is going to dictate whether we have the economic growth that will in fact be able to sustain and pay for the other 15 elements of the sustainable development goals. So that immediate, there are things that I would like to do immediately, but they aren't the long run uh, goals of education. Demi, you want to respond to that? If, are you satisfied with the answer? Uh, I'm satisfied. I think in terms of thinking more specifically about ego, I think you have to get your 
your thrill out of your objective. And the only way you can really do that is, as Eric said, <laughs> have a long view. Um, take, uh, make sure you have good statistics. Um, but really look for who's doing it best so that you can apply it locally. And, and like I said, I think ultimately you have to decide what's your goal and know that you'll have to be very open if you want to get there. We have a lot of philosophers on the stage, I feel, <laughs> in a way. But anyway, Jesse, you're going to go ahead. And yes, I think the uh, most interesting point from this panel is that I heard some difference on the opinions uh, about the necessity of universities uh, make students be prepared for career with the panel before. I, I saw the difference. It's very interesting. But I'm also kind of nervous because uh, I was the one who brought up this topic uh, on the last panel. Uh, but I think um, what I mean is that I need to talk about the China case because um, Mr. He talked about China is is very different uh, between uh, the provinces and different regions of China. Because we saw the, the PISA result of last year. China was so top ranking. But the targeting city is Beijing, Shanghai, Jiangsu, and Zhejiang. So the two cities, Beijing and Shanghai, they are definitely the richest city in China. And then Jiangsu and Zhejiang are the two richest provinces in China. Alibaba is from uh, Hangzhou, which is a city of Zhejiang. And I think the result is interesting that we only see the education situation for these four cities, for these four regions. I think we need to think more about the unprivileged areas in China. We have Gansu, we have Guizhou, we have Ningxia, we have these uh, north and west regions in China. The, the situations are totally different. I think we, we couldn't stay in the ivory of, of that result. And um, Chinese educationers uh, cannot be, be proud of that piece of result because we have a lot to work on. And I think a probably viable solution uh, for that situation is that we need to provide more professional education, more vocational education for these unprivileged regions to make the people there have the skill or have the ability to make their own life. And uh, I think that's what I mean. Uh, it's not only targeting to elite education, but to all of the citizen education. I think uh, education is all about empowering and enabling everyone to, to be success in their own life. Mm. The first step is they need to feed themselves, they need to feed their family. And oh, I remember we also talk about India case, talk about global South cases. Uh, I think that's the meaning of vocational education I mentioned mm. on the last panel. I think our conversation really uh, for the next, uh, the second panel has been so much uh, in a very inspiring way on the disparities that are going on in the world in terms of resources for education and the ways of education, not just among countries, but also within countries, uh, but among different localities and within countries among different social groups as well. So I want you, uh, Fred, if you could also comment about that, if you can, and some of the solutions, because earlier you provide one solution, say, oh, Jack Ma and I, we entrepreneurs trying to provide some kinds of education to the um, you know, disadvantaged uh, economically, at least, uh, areas of uh, China, which is a developing country. Uh, but I just want to know, what is the ultimate solution you, seek, you see in the systematic building of our system now, not just in China, but also in other economies to address the divide of resources? Is that the right question, Danny? Is, is this the right question, Jesse? Okay, okay, go ahead. Oh, that, that's a tough one. Um, because if you talk about, there are two things I think we're talking about. It's one is about education. Uh, specifically, uh, we talk about sending the top level teachers back to the, you know, the most remote place. I think that's idea, but it's very hard to do. But what we could do is we can, uh, actually that's one of the things our company, Bright Scholar Education, is doing. To, we send our teachers top teachers to those rural areas to train their teachers, okay? Because they are already there, okay? Instead of moving our teachers from so-called tier one cities 
to a place they don't even know how to make a living. That's impossible, but we can send them there or have their teachers come to our company, so we train them. So they go back to where they come from, so they can continue tr to uh, teach the kids there. That's one thing we could do in terms of education. But the thing is, even those kids get educated well, they go to move on, they go to university in big cities, they stay in big cities, so they, they're not going back. Um, so the economy there is not really changing that much. That is not just purely an educational problem. That actually need takes uh, policies and work with the government and the society to help them to reduce their poverty. A lot of times it's not about, uh, at least the, the way we do it, it's not giving them the money. Because if you give them the money, they're going to use it up at some point and then and go back to what it was. So typically we send a teen, actually uh, our, our sister company do is to send a teen there. It's almost like a management consulting team go to a village and help them figure out what trees they need to plant, what businesses they can do, and then uh, help them to actually establish the, whatever the industry or, uh, or business they, they could have, um, tailoring to uh, the specific situation they have. Then they are able to, for example, there are peop rural area in Gansu province which is far, uh, far northeast of, uh, nor northwest of China where they can raise hawks. Okay, hogs are very expensive, or pigs, in China, that you can sell those pigs to the big cities there so they can make a decent living there. So they, once uh, our team leave, the, leave that village, they are left with a sustain, sustainable business so they can make a better living. Uh, otherwise, uh, we go back and forth, back and forth, it's not gonna fundamentally change their lives. Mm. I think what you talk about can also be some if there's an ancient, ancient saying, there China's ancient saying for everything, we have another saying for this, which is you don't want to just give a fish, you want to teach people how to fish. That will be the legacy with them for long generations to come. Now, Damien. So, um, I think I, I learned a lot actually by, by what you uh, all just said um, also again from the legislative perspective. I think what you said about the divide on uh, you know, uh, developed countries versus developing countries, um, what we always try to see within Europe is to say they're structurally weak areas and they are in every country. Even my supposedly rich country Germany has structurally weak areas not only in the east of Germany, uh, the former communist areas, but also actually in the west. And so I think to learn from the best practices that you are also developing in terms of you know, how do we actually live with the fact that people, even if they get the good education, then just stay away and don't return to their, to their original home areas. So I think that's a, that's a challenge that we will face in very small regions and you um, obviously much more on a, on a much bigger scale. So I think that's definitely something that I'll uh, take with me. And um, I think from a legislative perspective, what I tried to say earlier is that there is this purpose of um, creating critical thought, but I do agree that the second purpose has to be how do we create equal starting chances for people no matter where they're born. And this is, um, I think, a, a big a question mark for me, and so to take these best practices from you is very interesting. So if, if you have more ideas on, um, yeah, somehow empowering more people who are disadvantaged in the current situation, I think it would be very interesting for me. So it, it's a worldwide problem, as we saw at the very beginning today of the gaps in social economic status and income of families. Um, and it's a problem that uh, a few countries have actually solved. Some of it have done it better than others. Um, the simple takeaway that I have from studying schools for a long time is that it's the quality of the teachers that matter. So you can per perhaps send better quality teachers, which is a big problem with the geographic distribution there. Not as big a problem in Germany, where it, um, but it's still a, a problem. Um, or you can try to upgrade the whole quality of the whole teaching force. Since you are coming from the U.S., why don't you use some examples coming from the U.S.? Well, uh, the U.S. Uh, successful ones or failed ones, too, also. The U.S. examples, uh, the, the background is that in 1965, uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson 
declared a war on poverty in the United States. And if you trace gaps in achievement uh, by socioeconomic status from 1965 to, to, to today, you find nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed, even though billions of dollars have been spent on uh, low-income areas. The place where it's changed, which was brought up this morning, is Washington, D.C. And what happened in Washington, D.C. was that they decided they were going to take seriously the quality of teaching in the schools. They gave very large rewards to the best teachers, and they fired the worst teachers. Now, that's a hard thing to say in any education audience to use the word fired, but there were some teachers that were not up to, to standards, and there were others that you just desperately wanted to keep. And they made the hard choice, lots of political difficulties of doing that, and what they found is that that has improved the level of education and the disparities that exist within Washington, D.C. Houston, um, Dallas, Texas is doing exactly the same thing. The evidence there is that if you take the worst schools in the city of Dallas, which is a large metropolitan area with all kinds of problems, if you take the worst schools there and pay very good teachers to go into them, very good teachers will go in if they're paid to do it, and you can close the gaps of schools. Mm. So working on what we know works, which is quality teaching, um, is an answer, but it's usually the one we avoid because we say, oh my, it's so hard to change the teachers. I remember dearly, Eric, the example you mentioned, especially in Washington, D.C. I was a correspondent there. We covered the uh, big social debate it created as a result. It was really stirred up at that time. Susan, you can testify to that as well, since you were also serving the administration at that time. You know, we have a wonderful discussion on the stage, but different from the earlier panel, I do want to open up the floor a little bit because sitting in the floor, actually, there are people much brighter than I am, and they have much better questions than what I asked earlier. So can we maybe two to three chances to our, you know, our audience, and then we come back once again for a discussion here on the stage. Do we have a microphone? If we don't, you have probably have to come up. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much, the lady in green. Uh, so anyone have a question or a comment, please do that. Okay, this gentleman over here. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, not a, a five-minute speech, but rather a comment and a short question, if you can. Yeah, hi. Yes, I'm great, great point. Who you are? I'm Martin Henry. I represent the teachers' unions, and I'm interested in the comment on the quality of teaching because what we've heard this morning, and I think quite correctly, is that teachers are in the best position to make a difference. How do you develop a system that's supportive when you're also advocating firing accountability mechanisms and approaches which are about spreading fear within the education system? Mm. How could you support it to the teacher, but at the same time you say, fire them, you know, if you don't like them? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, let's collect the question and then we come back for the discussion. Eric, you probably handle that, okay? Uh, any other questions? Any other? Do we see some hands in the audience? Just some brief comments and brief questions if you can. Any other did I see? So you agree with what's going on? This sounds like a classroom. Any questions? Okay, why don't we uh, let Eric and the others to handle that. You, you want to go first? No, I'd like to give it to Professor Tang. Oh, Professor from Tang. The, uh, National Institute of Education in Singapore. Yeah, Professor Tang, brief comments, brief question. Okay, over there. Yes, Professor Tang, can you raise your hand so that our staff know? Yeah, thank you. Actually, the solutions often are already there, you know. But I think what is often lacking is the conversation between the stakeholders that are helping with the teacher professionalism from the perspective of the school, the teachers, the community, the government, you know. 
I think if you can have just better coherence and integration, you would already have solved quite a lot of problems. Okay, let's have Susan also because Eric raised that issue earlier. Susan, please. And I'd also love to hear from Maria Helena because she has <laughs> dealt with this issue in Brazil. Um, I guess I would want to add to that question, how do we attract uh, higher quality of teachers to the classroom? In the United States, for example, it is not an esteemed profession, and so we're getting the bottom of the class interested in becoming teachers. So my question is, how do we attract, as Singapore does, as Shanghai does, top-level people to go into teaching? So we don't have to worry about firing the worst. We just come back to, as we used to have in the United States, attract the best to go into education. Mm. Attract the best. And we have a gentleman over there asking a question. Who you are and the question. My name is Hardin Coleman. I'm a professor and dean emeritus of uh, BU Wheelock College of Education at Boston University. And my question, I want to go back to the university question that we had before. And um, this issue of the university as producing knowledge and scholarship and then also vocational training. Do you see in both this panel and the previous panel that one of the issues may be that a large number of schools, colleges that no longer have a function and should turn over to more vocational function while there are other universities that will uh, maintain their role as liberal arts universities. Thank you. And a brief comment over there. We have one lady over here and that will be the last one. We'll bring well, all the questions back to the stage. Yes, please. Well, <coughs> Maria Helena from Brazil. Uh, first, I would like to uh, approve and support the question of the man, that man, yes, you. I had I had, I had this question for the, the other panel. Second, uh, the question of the man representative from the teacher unions, you. Uh, this is a question in the whole world. There is this question, how to improve uh, teacher uh, profession and how to uh, improve teacher quality. This is quite different. And I think that one of the biggest problem is teacher colleges. Teacher colleges are not preparing teachers to uh, face the challenges they have at school level. In general, teacher leaves teacher colleges, initial teacher training, without knowing. And on the other side, teach, in, turn, in training teacher, oh my god, uh, continuous teacher training at school level uh, in general are not facing the problems that all of, the, of you are uh, mentioned. The problems of develop the basic concept, uh, skills and competencies. Yeah. Uh, so this is the problem in my view. There is a big debate but it's very far from school level and far from public schools in the whole world. Okay, uh, final comments and question from there. We come back to the discussion on the stage. Thank you. My name is Dorothy Gordon and I normally work on technology and education, but I'm a development economist and I've been fascinated that we've had all of this discussion. Nobody is talking about budgets and what it will cost. I'm from- They talk Af about budgets in different words earlier, yes. Yes, but let's be, serious about it. I come from Africa. We will have the most half of the world's population under 20 in just a few years. What is it going to cost us to actually develop those people? The kind of world that you're talking about, a technology facilitated, a technology enabled world. Well, we got a lot of them. A lot of questions. See, they have much better talents than I am. Uh, can we maybe have the young leaders, uh, can we do that, uh, to respond to all of these questions, but select the one that you feel really passionate about? So I, I like that you uh, mentioned cost, and you said, what is it going to cost us to do it? I think it's too expensive not to do it. And so the easy answer right now is we need to pay teachers more. We need to financially give incentives to them because 
I'm from a place in San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley, where um, I left a very profitable career in financial technology because I had an intrinsic calling to education. I was advised by friends and mentors to not get my graduate degree because there would be very low economic opportunities for me, and still I did it. And now, even today, as an educator at UC Berkeley, I am barely making ends meet in some ways and still paying a very high cost of graduate education. So not only mm. am I paying debt on receiving a graduate education, but I'm also advising students and telling them, yeah, I don't see how being an educator is going to be profitable. And I always tell the students that I advise, take care of yourself first so that you can empower others. So I think if we really want to improve the quality of teachers, we need to glamorize them. We need to provide them with economic incentives. I think it's hilarious that we've got investment bakers making six-figure salaries mm -hmm. when I don't see the utility they provide in the same way as educators and doctors. And so we have to change the way we're investing. But the question really is how, right? We all know we need to change it. We talk about it for decades, but the question really Give is how. Give us more money. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. I, I would love to take that question because uh, I You used ran, to be an investment banker. I used to be a U.S. bank. I worked for Morgan Stanley before I got into education. Okay. I really love that question because it's very easy to say we want to do this and do that. But exactly like you, this lady said here, where is the money coming from? Okay. We would always love to do things that we, we, we have hard for. But a lot of times, if you don't make a living, it doesn't work. Okay. That's it. So I run a for-profit uh, education company. Therefore, and we are also NYSE listed, so I have my shareholders. Therefore, I always have to think about budget. Okay, for, of course, we want to give our teachers best salary and best benefit and all of that. But unfortunately, like it or not, it all costs money. Okay? So therefore, you have to find a way, it's just like everything else, any other industry, you have position your product or service in a way that it can be soft, sustainable. Okay. If you run a school, which I personally experienced before I became the CEO of the company, we have been losing money for 20 years. You know, if you continue to lose money, at one day, you're going to have to shut it down. Okay. If you shut the school down, forget about what you want. Okay. It's going to end right there. Okay. So, how we, so, so just like every other industry, you have to figure out, you know, develop a product or service that people would be willing and happy to pay for. Of course, at the same time, we also have charity schools that are great. It's 100% free for, for kids with limited resources. But you can't say, well, you know, give, I mean, just like any government want to say, they're probably going to say publicly as well, I want the best talents go to the education industry, we want to pay them well. But where is the money coming from? All right. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, for example, like China, have been increasing its budget in education year after year, which I have seen, okay? We have seen that. So the quality of education in China have improved dramatically. And I was actually doing research on this about, uh, I was born in the 70s. Back then, people are worried about, you know, actually during the Cultural Revolution when I was born, people worry about it, what's gonna happen in China and with all the things going on, you know, I never worry about another Cultural re Revolution in China. Why? Because back then, there were six million soldiers in China, only two million intellectuals, meaning people with college degrees. Now we only have two million soldiers in China, but we have 200 million people with college degree. So you have different perspective. So, so, so of course, that changed a lot. Another thing I want to answer is really the union question. Luckily, I don't have a union. I have more than 5,000 teachers, but I don't have a union. But, uh, I do not agree that we cannot, uh, I, I don't know, this word was used, firing teachers, okay? Mm. Just like in any other profession, there are, there are better performers and there are relatively kind of bottom performers, okay? I, our company, we fire teacher every year, if you like to use the word firing, because there are people, for example, they are, in our view, it's not up standard of teachers. For mm. example, they, Drink and drive and get into an accident. That's a breaking the law. Okay, that's not a good example for students. So if you do that, we fire you on the spot. Okay, 
And there, are, of course, I can raise a lot of other issues that uh, we think you are not a very good example for your students. Mm. And we know, parents know, I mean, it's not about your score. It's about do you have effort. See, some of the teachers we do genuinely see, can see that do care about the students. They see the student eye to eye and trying to do the best to help students. Even if their score is not that great, that's not a cause for firing. But there are teachers do not necessarily care that way. Mm. You, we see that again and again, we're going to have to fire them. So we get a better one. To honor those with the greatest qualities and to make sure those with not up to standard qualities will not be in the team will be one of the best ways to honor those who are coming with the real qualities. Uh, Eric, you want to also say something? I'm not, I'm not saying what you do in your company is exactly right or wrong, because I'm not here, uh, uh, Jerry, to judge about your company. But uh, just generally speaking, Eric, please go ahead. Let me respond to Mr. Henry in, in the following follow-up questions on this. Um, first, I don't think you necessarily have to have a system that is only based on fear of firing. It's, it's many jobs, in at least in the United States, 80% of the jobs people are subject to being fired. They aren't fired regularly because that's not the way you'd run a business. The very poorest performers that aren't competing are. I think that in the United States, and here's where we start to get into the divergence of different um, countries and their systems. In the United States, we way underpay our teachers and that we should, in fact, be paying our teachers quite a bit more. My own estimates are we underpay our teachers by over 20%. Um, but that doesn't mean that you should uh, pay everybody 20% more because some are worth more than, than that difference and some are worth less. And that if you increase the overall salaries, we would be much better off. We can't do it, Marina, Helena, uh, through teachers' colleges as we know it now because we're not really sure what makes for a good teacher and who's going to do very well in the classroom till we see what people do in the classroom and how they uh, take to their task. And so I'm not, I don't think that solving the teacher college question is one that's going to solve our teacher problem for some time because we just don't know the answers there. I think that we have to make our best guesses, pay the teachers a good salary, give them better respect out of the good salary, but treat them like professionals. And what, what's a professional? A professional to me is somebody who is willing to be held accountable for performance. And so I would like to teach all, treat all teachers as professionals mm. and have them held accountable, accountable for performance. Yeah, Danny? Um, in addition, I would just like to mention that, um, you know, the question was brought up of how do we pay them. I would like to consider education a public good. Um, there shouldn't be a goal of how do we make education profitable because that's not the goal of education. It's to empower individuals to contribute to the economy to increase human capital. So if we continuously add these monetary factors to the goals of education, I think we're going in the wrong direction. And I think there's many countries whose governments prioritize putting money into public education and unfortunately, Professor Hanischek mentioned this before, but the United States, there's been a divestment in public education for the past 30 years, and now the PISA results are starting to show that. And in addition, you're seeing um, negative health outcomes. And I'm not going to say that there's a direct correlation, but if we are not having governments invest in education and seeing it as a public good and a human right, then I don't think we're going to improve. Let businesses make money and let educations improve individuals. Mm. Jesse. Yeah, I would not discuss Mr. Henry's uh, question from a, that top-down degree, but as a student, I'm really interested in teachers' questions because uh, my only occupation for the past 20 years is student. And as a student, I really want my teacher to have some pressure. That's not revenge. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just 
teachers are doing assessments, evaluations for us, but we want more evaluation for our teachers. Uh, actually, uh, when I was in Cornell, there's a website I will use every time before I enroll the classes. It's called Rate My Professors. <laughs> and the information, the comments on that website is so accurate. And it seems like the administration of my school just never knows about this website. Because some of the comments um, is, is just so accurate. And we want probably... Now you tempted all of us to go on that website and check <laughs> it out. We just want a clear and open channel from the students to report what they think uh, to the school. It, it, it's not necessary to be complete uh, by bad comments, probably good comments on teachers. And I, I understand there are uh, complicated cases for different universities because some of the professors may have much better uh, academic achievement, research achievement than their performance in classroom. But I think um, universities, colleges need to give more value on how the teacher perform on just simply teaching. Because universities are not only institutions for research, they're also school. Uh, I think that's my opinion from a pure student. And for another question uh, about the separation of uh, vocational schools and elite or liberal education schools, I, I would like to uh, speak about China case again, because uh, China does have a separation on the system. We have, in China we call Zhigao, sort of like professional high school or professional, or Da Zhuan, uh, sort of like professional universities, only teaching about uh, vocational skills. Uh, they, it's, uh, it's not part-time school, it's a full job school, full-time school. Probably teaching about cooking, about hair cutting, about uh, serving as other roles in the industries. I think uh, China has a lot of equality problems in education, but they are having a good shape on building up a system. And also for uh, elite education or uh, liberal education in China, we also have a system called Gaokao. It's the college entrance examination, uh, national-wide, uh, ensures the fairness of high school students entering college. We don't care about extracurricular. We don't care about who you can get recommendations letter from. We don't care about do you know the trustee board of universities or not. We just care about how you perform mm -hmm. on this academic test. Uh, are you hardworking enough to prove you are able to enter a good university? I see. Jesse, I'm sure you're not here to preach to anyone about the so-called model. Because uh, yeah. every country has their own circumstances in a way yes, yes. to figure out what's the best for them. But certainly we can learn from each other's examples and know the context in which those things are being done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. just sharing the examples of China. Right? Yes, exactly. So I think that would be interesting. But Daniel, uh, also from your, your side, and then we come to Damien, so, and, and we'll wrap it up. So, so like Jesse, I went to Cornell. Um, and when you look at the Ivy League school or the private university model, right, then you'll understand <laughs> why teaching is more or less important, um, why some people get in by recommendation and some don't. So I think it's always important to look at the model. Going back to the discussion of teachers, I'll always remember being in Finland and one of the ministry officials who said to me, well, I know in the US why you can't get math teachers. And I said, oh, and why is that? And he said, because if you can do numbers, you know you can't afford to be a teacher. <laughs> and so I think when simple math Si follow, follow the numbers or the simple math will tell you the story and that's true whether it's the universities or it's true um, on having a, um, a, a teaching force that uh, teaches at a high quality level. Okay, Damien? So there have been uh, many issues uh, touch upon my mother as a teacher so I can understand that the whole package of reputation um, and remuneration has to work in a way um, that actually increases the, like the, 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 I think the uh, profession. And I won't uh, add on that even though I feel emotionally about it. Um, but since there was a mentioning on the vocational training and you also explained a bit like the um, Chinese system, I think one element that is really interesting for me is that uh, we s often seem to project to our students that there's one way and there's one, basically one great system you can be measured by, and it's very one-dimensional. 
And in Germany, we see that people who would be amazing nurses or could um, actually earn a lot of money by uh, being um, a woodworker or a stone worker now are being pulled into the university system because it's supposedly cooler and then their monetary expectations are actually going down when they go there because if they would just stay in the vocational system, which is actually, I think, a bit of an uh, issue of debate between the OECD and Germany <laughs> from time to time, um, there is, I think, uh, very often a, a much more suiting profession to the multidimensional interest, like the, the interest of that specific child or student. And so mm. I think the question is, how can we maybe build a system that allows you in lifelong learning also to, to change that path again once you have decided what, you know, uh, you decide early on maybe I want to go in that kind of way and then maybe at some point you say uh, actually an academic kind of career could also be something for me. So I think it's a very valid question of how do we, you know, spread the, the different paths in life to the very different individual characters we have in our society. Okay, and Eric, I promise you with a one response, but one response only. One quick response on cost. Um, this also differs across countries. In Africa, yeah, on average, pays much too little for its schools. But if you saw the charts this morning that Andreas put up, he showed very large differences in the outcomes of students dependent upon the amount of money spent. Some countries spent a lot and got a lot. Some countries spent a lot and got little. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, a very simple way to pay for these higher teacher salaries that I would like to pay would be a very slight increase in this student-teacher ratio which would, in fact, pay for all of the increases to teachers that we have not been doing in the United States. All right. Okay, we're running out of time. Michael is giving me the sign. We're about to run out of time. So if I could, every one of you, one takeaway from the other speakers you listen to today, what would that be? Daniel. Someone else go first. <laughs> um, I think my big takeaway is that when you're in the... Oh. Sorry. I guess, um, you know, my, my big takeaway is really that I'm really excited about the next generation. Uh, my takeaway is uh, when do we start working? <laughs> when do we start making this happen? Okay. That's a great question. And Eric? Yes, <laughs> my takeaway is that there are wide differences across countries but that everybody should be focused on what students are learning and the outcomes. Mm. Jesse. Yeah, my takeaway is also about the differences, and we can always uh, learn from something from the differences, and it's pretty valuable for me. Mm. Please. My takeaway is really the lifetime learning is always learning. Damien, last but not least. My takeaway is the importance of the reputation of teachers. My takeaway is we have so many bright minds and talented people sitting in this room. We will. Danny, make it happen, right? If you think it's right, then give us a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen on the stage. Thank you so much. And our audience, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.